reassessing what eerie is and why it is important to me, I'm reminded of a notion I had as a teenager. Something is very wrong. We live in a culture that is not made for the people who inhabit it. Though we and our ancestors created it, we serve it. It does not serve us. I'm not sure where our culture went wrong. Was it industrialization? Colonization? Agriculture? The first human who ever modified his surroundings in an attempt to improve his conditions? We came to worship things and safety above all else. This has led to material comfort, where the physical threats we once face from our environment are largely removed. But it has led to a sterile environment that lacks the stimulation we once received from the danger we faced. And above all, it has created a culture that worships consumption above people. Convinced that ever more things and innovation will lead us to fulfillment, we chase consumption, sure that the next thing or experience will bring happiness. What we have forgotten is the world outside of the screens and the buildings. A world that celebrates the world and the people who fill it, and life and lives lived. While it is in vogue to blame this or that technology, political or economic system or group of people, I blame everything I have ever seen and everyone I have ever known. Our culture has become pathological. So, uh, my friend Brian uh, Gin Juice, he wrote this whole series, 20,000 words on the forum, a series of posts about needs. That was near the beginning of the posts. Um, and I got him on the podcast. And so I hope you enjoy this conversation with Brian to talk about needs that we have in our pathological culture. So I read the whole thing last night. I don't know if you know this, it's 20,000 words. I did not know that. I was also like, I don't even think <laughs> remember the start of it by the time I finished. Right? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Are you using the idea now? Are you thinking about this in an explicit way? I tried to make, or like... before I started it, I tried to make like a table and just got out of hand, really. <laughs> I kind of use it. I don't, I haven't found like a, I don't feel like I found a format for, I don't want to, I don't know if I would, if it's like possible to make like a totally analytic thing, but I'd like to have something slightly more analytic than just kind of like guessing, which is what I'm doing now. Right. <laughs> or like doing whatever I feel like, but yeah, I, so I'm kind of using, I think about it, but I don't have like a, a good way to do it. I have the table that I made, but it's like way too big to use. What is it like a lot? Like, did you just list like a ton of different needs and like sub needs? Yeah. And, and like stuff kind like of that? like what categories they would go under and then like how okay. well they were met, but it was just like, it got too big and I was like, I can't really. Yeah. It was an interesting exercise to do when I did it, but then I couldn't use it to like think about anything. Right. Further. I did that before I started, like while I was coming up with the idea. So I haven't even, that's probably, I don't know when I did that, maybe like six months ago or more. Oh yeah. Yeah. Cause like last night I just made a table. It's got like, I have like 10 things on here and then just ranked them quickly. And it was like, oh yeah, that's interesting. Just, I mean, super high level, but like, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to use it. Just like sketching a web of goals might be totally useless. This yeah. is kind of my version of web of goals. Like this is like, yeah, I had like. The semi-eerie is my version of eerie, and then this is like my, I don't know. The web of goals is cool, but I could, I, I had the same problem with it, actually. I could never really, like, use it. <laughs> yeah. Like, I see how the thinking works, but I'm like, ah, it's a little hard to use. Yeah. Well, okay, so let, let's back up. What, what, where did, what did this project start as? Like, why did you start writing? What were you trying to solve or accomplish by starting the writing project? I was having trouble... You know, when you start the skills thing, it's like you have, you start with almost no skills and it's hard. You have all these skills you're trying to build, but it's hard to pick which ones you need and come up with a reason for like why you're doing it that way. So it was my attempt at figuring out a way of why to do certain skills. Cause I think the book recommends maybe has a recommendation for how to do it, but you know, I never like to listen to anyone else so <laughs> it's always come with my own way so so it was basically right because you can kind of come away from the forms or from the book with the perspective of like oh right polymathy skills i'll get on it and then it's like oh wait what skills should i learn and it's like you you could fall into a, a trap of like picking skills at random and then they're not fun or like it gets 
the process gets screwed up because there's some other unmet need in your life that is has consequences which you were writing about in your life and that's like messes your life up in some way and so like that skill you were pursuing doesn't work out because maybe you should have been like a way to prioritize skills is to like okay what needs do i have that aren't being met appropriately and how can i solve how can i meet those needs with money um at the beginning of your post this is maybe ancient history for you but at the beginning since i read it last night i might be even fresher on some of it than you no, you're definitely, the, I, yeah you're definitely fresher on it than me i mean at the beginning of the post like something that jumped right out me was like you you said something is very wrong you've had this feeling since you were young we live in a culture that is not made for the people who inhabit it <clears throat> and you talk about how you you'd been reading and doing both therapy stuff and reading um bill uh bill plotkin's bill yeah bill plotkin's stuff and he uses the uh, the concept of the pathological culture so you use that idea a lot so could you maybe talk about i think a lot of people are attracted to eerie because they have some sense that something's wrong that there's something pathological about culture and they're trying to like figure out how to solve that can you speak to like what some of that the forms of those pathologies take yeah i mean that's to me like a really big question but uh i just think it's mostly like about not caring it's our i don't feel like stuff is actually set up to care about people it's set up it's it's sort of hard to explain without reading that background material or even the more i just started reading like by chance right before uh this you called like i was reading radical acceptance and the more I read books like that, like they sort of all talk about this thing. Like in that book, she's this, I'm just going to talk about that because this is on my mind, but yeah. she's talking about how the others are talking about how she always felt like sort of bad about herself. And even when she realized that and acknowledged it and became like a Buddhist to try and solve it, like it's kind of like perniciously follows you into that path. And it's really hard to get out of it. So it's a little bit hard to talk about because it's like this thing that's just kind of like under the surface of everything. But it's really like promoted in the way I think our culture operates. And that's like, it's kind of like once you, <laughs> I'm trying to think of how to explain to someone, it to someone who isn't familiar with the source material. Cause like, it's kind of like an adolescent way of thinking in the way that Plotkin talks about it or just like a, it's very like egotistical way of thinking about things. But if you're in that mindset, it's hard to like, because that mindset is so promoted, it can really like encompass everything. Like the, that actually that was the section of radical acceptance I was reading is she becomes a Buddhist and she just talks about how her ego just like incorporates Buddhism into itself. <laughs> and she like doesn't, she doesn't escape the thing she's running from because it's so easy to loop it in to everything you do. So, but I, yeah. I don't think that I feel like we're very caught up in this like pursuit of stuff or just like making yourself look good. If people don't actually think about like what they personally need, which is not usually that much stuff. <clears throat> like that's is the why eerie is so like radical. It's like, oh, don't spend your entire life. It's just like what I had kind of been convinced the point of life was by just growing up in the society. It's just like that's not the point. And also like every single thing I'd ever been frustrated with or thought was going wrong or like, you know, just like from things like environmentalism to like political inequality to when someone's mean to you, I don't know, Eerie was just, I was like, oh man, this dude just like sidestepped all of it. Like, holy shit. But then I guess part of the reason I did this is because like why I was like, why it has some like deeper meaning to me, but what is that? It's not just like, oh, I'm going to save a bunch of money so I don't have to go to work, you know? Like, that's not that interesting or it's pretty easy once you figure it out. Right. Well, because there's, <clears throat> there is at least one need that mainstream society, mainstream culture does meet well, right. And meets our economic needs well. And I, you made the argument, <clears throat> you made the point that it actually over meets our needs or it's like, I mean, I would say that like it meets our economic needs and then it convinces us that we haven't yet, that we keep needing more and more and more. And it gives us the idea that our economic needs are the only needs we have as human beings that exist. 
And so we like ignore all of these other needs that we have when we're like in the, in the construct of, of mainstream culture. Um, yeah, that's maybe actually, that is probably the answer to the question you asked me in a more succinct way. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, that's, yeah, that's what I think is, is that it's like, we, it just ignores, we just ignore the non, and we'll try to solve these non-economic problems with money, like more and more money or more and more stuff or more and more whatever you're getting from like just the work by is kind of the only world you exist in paradigm. Yeah. So what are some, what are some of the other non-economic needs and like, how did you approach thinking about needs? And I, I mean, I feel like it's so difficult to see them. That's why I, I actually am not like I, in the series that you're talking about, I use like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but I'm actually not a lot of, I get a lot of comments about like, Oh, what about, uh, we don't know about Maslow or like this specific thing. And I was like, I'm not a huge proponent of it. It's like a really comprehensive framework that someone came up with. Yeah. So I think it's pretty, it's hard to, you're kind of trying to see what you don't know almost. So that's why I borrowed a framework because right. I was like, I don't think I, I don't think I know, but so from him, it's like, I think like social and emotional needs. And then he had like intellectual and aesthetic needs. Those are to me the biggest ones. I mean, he also has like the safety ones and the like physiological ones. Right. I think like safety to a certain extent and physiological is like kind of the trap of like, like you kind of can meet those with money and then we just get convinced that we're not mm. doing it to a higher and higher level. But it's like, no, you are really mm. easily doing it. Wait, so you're saying that that's part of the trap, meaning like, we get messages that convince us that our physiological need and safety needs aren't being met even when they are, or even when we could easily. And so we keep like pursuing that. Yeah. Yeah. I also think at a very base level, like you can meet those needs with money. Yeah. I mean, particularly the physiological ones, right? Like you can buy right. all the shit you need to stay alive. <laughs> yeah. Buy food, rent. Yeah. yeah. All that stuff is like pretty easily covered. Yeah, yeah. Then and then money. also in that in that post, I also talk about there's kind of all these new needs that I noticed that were hard to put in a category that I called needs of modernity. Mm. Or, I can't say it, modernity. And yeah, it's just kind of like shit that, like, you kind of need to survive in our culture now. Like you could argue a car, you could say yes or no, but a lot of people need a car to make their lives run. Yeah, like, like I mean, care. you don't need medical care to live, but like, it's most people are terrified to live without medical care. I mean, I would be terrified to live without medical care at all. Like, they're just like, you know, you'll never have it. Like, I'd be like, fuck. Right. <laughs> I thought I had this. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, most of the stuff that I, I end up paying for still or finding ways to meet, it, a lot of it is those needs of modernity. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think like, not to be that guy, but smartphones is like such an easy one. Like, it's objectively kind of difficult to, get away with living in modern society with that one or it's kind of a, just a pain in the ass so it's it's kind of a need and like access to the internet kind of a need it's hard to do any like there's lots of things it's just really hard to do without the internet yeah and these th those things like while they end up detracting like from all stuff a lot of the time and taking up a lot of i think people put a lot of effort into getting those things mm. uh they do also like a smartphone is fucking amazing like it does so much shit crazy <laughs> <laughs> it's just like really design i mean it's just designed that is, this is sort of the pathological thing like we got this great ass thing and it's like <laughs> we're gonna design it to addict you to it so you <laughs> don't talk to anyone anymore and it's like wow. i just wanted a calculator that was also a map man <laughs> <laughs> like, that shit was crazy <laughs> when you first got it you're like oh it's a calculator that's a map and i could talk to my mom on it but like crazy and then yeah. it's like no now you're just gonna watch videos of advertisements on it instead yeah and it'll, and it'll track you it's like that's not what i signed up for yeah we'll use this device you can have your calculator and be able to talk to mom but also we're going to build a simulation of your mind so perfect that we can make you buy anything we want to and you have no defenses because your brain is still paleolithic and it is completely no match for this leviathan of technology and design yeah like why would you fucking do that <laughs> we know exactly why though like it makes sense to us somewhere we're mad but it make we know why but that's why it's shit is <laughs> up. yeah so okay yeah, so uh, and i also the needs of 
modernity in this, like from an eerie perspective, I think those are kind of the things I kind of made that I made that because it's like, if you're going to use these things, you're going to pay for them. Like mm. when you're using those needs of modernity, you're like in pathological culture, like mm. pathological culture has shit that is to me at least worthwhile and like meets your needs. And it's just like, yeah, if you want to use like the modern medical system, like that shit is fucking crazy expensive. Like you're going to pay some money for it. Whereas if you're like, just going to learn how to sew your leg back on, you can do that. For free. <laughs> <laughs> like if you want to, you know, if you want to do some car shit or go on a fucking vacation to another country, like you're engaging with, you know, you're not like, that's kind of separate from ERE in a way. It's like, you can learn how to do anything your grandparents needed to do, basically mm -hmm. free. But you, maybe, well, with the exception of, like, they got appliances, I guess, like my grandparents. But, you know, anything that doesn't need electricity was, or was ever done without electricity or you don't want to use electricity to do, you can do it for free. But, yeah. like, once you, the more modern you start getting, it's going to be really hard to not pay for that. Or, like, someone's paying for it. Even if you can figure out a crafty way to not pay for it, like... Someone somewhere is paying a shit ton of money for it. I mean, I think that's a great categorization of needs and and the, and the acknowledgement that it's not like a strict needs in the sense that like air and water and food is a need, but that it is a need for participation in modernity. And then it's like, okay, well, your approach to that can be a couple of different things, right? It could be um, renunciation of certain things. Like some people are like, nope, no smart smartphones. I'm a flip phone person and they figure out how to do that. And there's a skill involved in learning how to navigate modernity with just a flip phone, right? Or not having internet at home or not having a car or these are the things that we tend to take for granted. And then there's levels of skill of getting those things for not as much money, right? Like, sure, it's one thing to have a smartphone. Like I have a smartphone, it's an iPhone, it's refurbished. I paid hundred dollars for it from black market or back market rather. And like, you know, I, it's a, I don't know, it's three versions old. I didn't need the new iPhone 13 that costs a thousand dollars or whatever. So there's like a skill that's like a weed level five skill, maybe four. I don't even know. Just like, okay, I don't have to pay that much for it, but there's like a limit to how efficient you can get with that. I mean, there's, all this is still, I think, based on living in an economy that's run on fossil fuels and like oil and stuff like food isn't really as abundant as it is but right now food is fucking abundant and you get it like anything that even this is what i have hesitated even when i said electricity because even electricity if you live in the first world is almost free at this point like it won't be forever but right now it is and like shit that's like maybe around 100 to even 80 or 70 years old like you're getting towards the where you're like almost getting that for free but shit that's like 15 years old you're not getting that for free like that shit was just invented. It's not, it's like crazy that we can get it for as cheap as we can. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> like taking that perspective. And also shit that is 15 years old, you don't fucking need. Like it's a little bit hard to operate without a smartphone, but I don't think it's actually that hard. I don't do it, but like I did do it. I know they've like updated some shit where you need all these apps for everything, but like realistically, yeah. we've just convinced ourselves that we need it. Right. It's far less convenient. Like banking needs multi-factor authentication with an app or whatever or you could just go into the branch and like this yeah, is me here's my birth that, certificate like, give the me my money, like, give the money you yeah. still just need an atm card really right so yeah there's ways around it but it's less efficient and it, it's like the more you the more you participate the more it gets the more difficult to guess but the less you participate like if you want yeah like i don't know needing passports or flying or whatever like there's some stuff that's going to be useful to have so then i th I feel like like for me a lot of the bulk of what you wrote about which is really interesting was the social community and emotional needs and yeah I think those for me i ignored them for so long that they were really big in my mind i also do feel like the community of vre is a little bit guilty of ignoring those things so there are also some of the stuff like i thought the aesthetic and uh like not i forgot what this is called the like knowledge one, the one. Yeah. yeah i thought those were gonna be big but i just found that i had like sometimes i just have more stuff to say about stuff like i don't i didn't mean to put that like social and emotional were like bigger than the aesthetic and the sure. like knowledge one but they just ended up being more posts because i had more to say when i started writing 
there's like a line after social and emotional in Maslow's hierarchy, which I, I don't know, I feel a little bit of both ways about, but where like those are kind of the ones you need to survive. And then above that, it's like the shit that like makes, brings you like fulfillment. Ah, uh, right. Where like learning and aesthetic are bringing you fulfillment and you kind of need like social and emotional to survive. Mm -hmm. Like below, below the line, if you don't have this, your life sucks. Above the line, if you don't have it, your life can still be fine, but it gets better. Yeah, I feel, to me, how I interpreted the idea is like below the line, you kind of, if you don't have those things, you will kind of like feel pain or you'll mm. be deficient in them. Mm. And above the line, it's like, if you don't have those things, you won't, you won't experience pleasure. Mm. It's kind of the same thing though. It's like, it's a little weird when you start really... <laughs> I don't know what he actually meant, but I, th I thought it was interesting that he put a lot. I kind of know what he means. It's like one yeah. is something you aspire to, and the other is something that if you don't have it, it's really going to fuck you up. Well, you you, you make the case that um, for a lot of people, their emotional and social needs aren't being well met in society. Why do you think that is? Because I think it's because we don't concentrate on them. I think everything above safety, and for some people, safety is not very, really very well met. Safety, I do think people acknowledge safety, though. Like, people will try to pay for safety once they start accumulating money. But they'll, like, specifically spend the money on safety. They'll try, I feel like they'll try to compensate for emotional and social needs, but not using actual things that compensate for it by just, like, buying stuff mm. to make us feel better or something or, mm. you know. But I feel like safety, people will be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to move out of this, like, crime-ridden neighborhood into a non-crime-ridden neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. they're like explicitly paying for it whereas like when it starts to come to social and emotional needs people don't really want to spend you know it doesn't feel good to spend money on those things it doesn't like you're not gonna like you don't want to buy your friends or pay someone to compliment you that's not gonna fulfill the need sure but also like a lot of the times spending money is wrapped up in the activities we use to fulfill our uh, social and emotional needs, right? Like a lot of times, like pe when people first start figuring out the ERE, the post-consumer praxis, you know, it comes to the like, well, all, like what me and my friends do is we go to the pub, we have drinks, we, you know, we spend money together. Like hanging out with my friends means spending money. Um, and so from a skills perspective, if you're trying to decouple yourself from needing to work all the time, then there's a skills component of figuring out how to get those needs met without spending a lot of money. Yeah, and that's, I guess that is sort of the point of it is to recognize that you don't need to go to the pub. What you need is to hang out with people who like you or mm -hmm. that you can joke around with or whatever, you know. It's just like, it, it is, it's kind of a way of targeting reducing spending still. Like, okay, I'm doing this thing, but what am I, what needs am I actually getting met out of this? And, you know, the, the hope is that you could find a better way to get them met, not just because that's the point that money isn't meeting your needs the best. Like, do the friends you get drunk with are those the people is that i mean i like to get drunk with my friends so yeah. <laughs> i'm not not that but you know if that was the only way i had friends i don't know i don't know if it'd be so fun yeah what you wrote that i thought was a great way of framing it is that the beauty is a lot of people a lot of communities recognize that something is wrong with society there's a sense of unease and there's various explanations for why that is and there's various approaches to that a lot of people's they're like step one for how to fix it is like have a revolution or like everything will collapse and we'll have something better or you know like some massive big transformation has to happen before they can get to like things being better for themselves um whereas fire and eerie is takes <laughs> takes the tools it's like well I actually just get really good at a certain element of this culture understand what's going on and then free yourself from it using the tools of it. There's a trap in that, which is that you can also like just stay focused on the economic side of things, right? Oh yeah, I mean, in the fire eerie community, I have definitely still, I'm still on the train of, I just noticed that a lot of people get trapped at like the wheat level five thing or they retire and they don't know what to do. I think there's even a thread now about like being bored in retirement, I'm just like, you cross over into like learning shit you're like how the fuck could you be bored like it's impossible there's so much shit to learn. <laughs> and like the world is just like so interesting and uh yeah i'm definitely looking i'm definitely always trying to think of how to like encourage people to see beyond the just we level five like oh i just need to get this money and then i'll be okay 
because you won't be okay if you get the money. There's so many. I do you mm. think there's a lot of get reach that point and they're like not as happy as they thought they would be? Oh, totally. I'm disappointed. So, yeah, I think it's because you're you're. I mean, you're not focusing on those other needs, and the more you hone in on just getting the money aspect, the less you're able to focus on your other needs. You're not mm. able to. You're not going to be exploring those things. I mean. Every time I get close to a savings goal, I do it too. I'm like, oh, I should, I like work a little bit more. And I'm like, now I can feel it. I'm like, I'll be ignoring my other things mm-hmm. that I need just to pursue this goal that really I don't even need to pursue, honestly. <laughs> it's it's just that substitution. It, it's that it's that base assumption that our society programs with us with, which is money is how you solve your problems. And so, so much of the freedom from is you freedom from work freedom from all these things and the solution for that is money the savings account the being being financially independent like what just like the idea that just popped in my head was that it's like step one freedom from dependence on the economy step two is like freedom to figuring out how to meet your other human needs without using money or without using them so much or without using money as a proxy for solving cognitive needs or emotional needs or social needs or other things like that so that, that that like provides a map that provides a post freedom map. I mean, and you're Mr. Semi Airy, so you know there doesn't necessarily have to be this like you're trapped and then you're completely free, right? There's there could be a middle point where you're like, oh, I don't need to spend that much money, so I just don't need to work that much, and I can just do that right now. I'm just going to work a little bit, earn a little bit of money, and then you have an a, an abundance of freedom to be pursuing all of these other things. Yeah, actually, I think I have a little bit of trouble articulating this needs thing properly I don't feel like I even captured in the post but in my opinion it's like a more comprehensive idea than like semi-eerie which I think was a little bit easier to understand and like write about for me yeah. and like talk about when we did the interview about that but yeah I don't think this is to me you don't need really the economic freedom you need very little economic freedom mm. to if you just focused on what you need I mean I still think that fire tends to over focus on money and it's hard not to overfocus on money because, like we said this whole time, you're trained to overfocus on money. But I don't think most of the people who fire end up, if they really, well, I don't know. <laughs> I guess there's a whole, the I've seen the Mr. Money Mustache as a whole like failure community of where they failed. But I, the people I talk to very have a 0% failure rate so far. So I don't know. It's hard oh, for me. I feel like I feel like if you plan it well enough, you're pretty safe from failing, and you actually grossly oversave, right? Which is not necessarily a problem if you've worked it into a web of goals or your needs or whatever. Like I don't, it becomes like less about it becomes less about optimizing once you get this whole thing in your mind because it's like, who cares if you oversave if you realize that there's like so much abundance right now and your needs could easily be met. Like, yeah, I think you probably are going to want to work and do something that makes you money at some point. Like, it's very easy to end up with oversaving. Right. And it's not necessarily a problem. Yeah. But you can uh, sacrifice your needs to oversave. And I mean, part of it's difficult because you make the point that our culture does not look kindly on people who fail, economically speaking. So, particularly for someone who's, whose story is they got into fire, they got an eerie, they told all their friends about it. They're like, hey, I'm frugal, I'm investing, I'm doing this, I'm doing the other thing. And then you say like, oh, I'm, I'm free now. And then if something happens, if you made a mistake in there somewhere and you have to go to, back to work and you don't want to do it, that's, that's, I mean, there's our culture. It's going to be tough to have that be your story and not have to deal with a ton of shame being mounted on you and judgment from our culture and that you generate from within yourself because of the cultural narratives. So that's just like incredibly difficult. And so like, I mean, I totally get the oversaving thing. Um, I'm not even trying to FI strictly speaking and I deal with that. I'm like, oh, I should probably get some more money. It's like, wow, I really don't, I really don't need to do that. But I think I just, I go through my head every day of being <laughs> well, like, like just being like, oh, you know, if I work this much, I could save this much. And I'm like, dude, why? Like, you really don't need to. Also, the more the more you get into the, the like, higher wheat level stuff, it's just, like, you really don't need that much money. You, like, you really, you realize that money is not going to protect you in so many circumstances and that you 
are accruing the ability to need money less and less. Hmm. But it still, feels, it still feels weird getting away from it. I don't, I don't know. It's really hard to break the psychological yeah. dependence. Yeah. I feel like it's like, I feel like at the beginning of my eerie journey, I sort of like figured it out. I was like, oh yeah, no, this makes sense. I don't, I don't need that much money uh, to, to feel okay. And then I, I had like a, and then a little bit later I had a slightly different, but when I examined it, it was actually the same like source of fear um, driving it. Um, so for example, I, I don't know, originally the first thing was like, oh, I'm going to work and then I'm going to FI and then I'll be done and that'll be great. And then when I got laid off, I was like, okay, yeah, semi re that sounds great. I'll do that. <laughs> um, but then when you're semi re you still have to put some cognitive overhead into figuring out how to, you know, earn your money, earn your cost of living so that you're default alive, um, which is something else you wrote about, which is great. Um, but then, so now I'm going back to like, well, maybe it would be great if I like earned enough money to be FI and then I wouldn't have to worry about it. And that's like, well, one more year syndrome and all this other stuff. It's difficult, but, but I'm noticing now and like your framework helped me realize this is what I'm actually doing is I'm trying to use money to solve an emotional need, which is a need, or maybe a, it's an emotional something or other. And it has to do with like fear about, I don't know if it's about my physiological state. It actually might be more like a status fear, uh, status, a fear related to status. Like, I don't want to, like, it would be horrible to my emotional state if I had to, like, ask someone for money or something like that, you know, in the future. Uh, and so I still keep trying to solve that with money, but. Yeah, no, I've, man, I mean, these problems, I think, are, like, the real problems that most of us face, honestly. It's very difficult Man, I don't know if this fucking be canceled immediately, but it's very difficult if you live in America to like actually fall below the amount of resources that will cause you to die. You know, barring, I mean, eventually you're going to hit like the medical conditions problem, but if you're healthy, it's hard. I mean, it's hard to like run out of food or, right? You know, yeah. yeah, the the cause the the, the things that threaten your safety and physiological they're they're not necessarily lack of abundance in the world their exposure to toxins it's the fact that you're in traffic because you drive a car it's the fact you know it's all these it's mental health issues it's it's other needs going unmet <clears throat> no i think you're right about that yeah and i do think that like i also talked a bunch about towards the end about like insecurities and i think that is a huge one too like it's what you're afraid of that holds you back more than what you don't have mm. is it's a misplaced fear of dying left over from something that's happened to you previously mm. where like you're you know you're whatever you however you conceptualize it like basically like your central nervous system or your like lizard brain or there's a million different ways to put it but is reacting to something and kind of like taking over your thinking process and it's like very very good at doing that without you knowing it mm. and when that happens you'll just start doing shit that is like not in alignment with what you say you want or what you think you want. And it's very, it's very, it, once you realize this is happening, it's like so pervasive that you are amazed that you never noticed it before. Like if you thought you were like a rational thinker, like oh my <laughs> God, you weren't, you weren't even good at noticing it in other people. <laughs> it's just crazy. <laughs> but yeah, it's really, hmm. it's just like this belief that you that's kind of like hardwired into us that we won't be okay that i think the modern world triggers over and over and over again in a way that we're not really built for i mean it, even that smartphone thing you said before it's like it's that it's like tapping into that circuitry rather than like what you can actually pay attention to right right because i mean advertising doesn't convince us that the things it's trying to sell us um, are useful and long lasting and will serve their purpose as well they tap into our insecurities they imply that if we don't buy this brand of dishwasher detergent then we won't have a nice family or something like that i had a there was a really brief period of my life where i actually didn't watch an ad for six ish months oh. and like when you rewatch an advertisement yeah utter insanity like the advertisements advertisements talk very very little about what the thing is about it's mostly just shows people being happy they're very loud and people like with friends and family near the thing. Right. 
I liked something else that you said, which is that pathological culture teaches us that we can fulfill our self-actualization needs through work. And in fact, that's like kind of the only option that's presented to us in culture is like, if you want to be self-actualized, you're going to do that by either being a really good employee or an entrepreneur or whatever, like work is how you're going to fulfill that. But then it largely doesn't even, it's like, we don't even know that we have emotional and social and, and other needs. Like for a lot of us, it just like completely glosses over that fact. It's like there's safety and physiological stuff. There's boats and cars and then there's self-actualization. And then it's like, that's all there is to being a human. Oh, no, boats and cars are the self-actualization, man. Come on. Please. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> I got it wrong. <laughs> yeah, I know. I think that's, I think that's really true. I do. I, this is something uh, I also hesitate to say this because it, people might get mad, but I feel like it's worse for like dudes. Like <laughs> um, really, I really feel like if you're a straight dude, it gets really pumped into you that, that is the that is the way to self actualize. I hang, I hang out with those fair, a lot of people who make fun of straight dudes a lot, and that is the thing they'll harp on. Oh, is that right? <laughs> like or, straight yeah. dudes, they're always like, kind of yeah, like... like yeah, like they're like, oh, you guys think you don't need community or other people, but you uh, like need it so bad because you just don't even know that mm. you need it. And for me, that was one hundred percent true. Mm. But yeah, I think it. I do think it's part of the. Mm. I think it's a problem for everyone, not just straight dudes yeah 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 totally. <laughs> <laughs> i think that's the dominant cultural message still i think is that you don't need like don't need community or other people or to like understand your emotions like emotions are mm. something to kind of get rid of that was definitely what i thought yeah i mean like, i can kind of see things that keep you from thinking rationally and rationally thinking is like the only way to think so yeah you if you make it on money and Again, when you if you're only thinking about from a physiological needs perspective, like if you don't if you have less money, you're go it's more likely that you're going to need to meet your needs through the other channels. But if you have a bunch of money, like order fucking DoorDash or you know, I don't know. You never you're never gonna be forced to rely upon a person you're not paying. So right. you in a way it's baseline actual physiological survival, you're not gonna need the other stuff. Whereas like some people will mm -hmm need to rely on other people to meet their baseline physiological need at some point right yeah that makes sense but yeah i i i don't i the i don't feel like social and emotional competency is really promoted though in our culture mm -hmm. like you don't learn it in school you're i think you're supposed to learn it from your parents but a lot of parents don't have those skills so they're not passing them on i just like the the way i came to think of everything as, as like to really rely on that pathological culture term and really believe it is just like so few people have a really good sense of themselves where they're like mm -hmm. communicating in this what that language would call like an adult fashion like most people are stuck in like an adolescent ego state mm -hmm. it's like whether they realize it or not making them somewhat miserable and it's just like okay if that is your like average person in your culture like what the fuck are you doing it's not working <laughs> your solution isn't correct and so, uh, also to me, this speaks to like all of these, uh, I'm saying so much shit in here that I feel like it's going to get me in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> it just speaks to like, like, look how much depression, anxiety, all that stuff. I, in my opinion, and this is my non-medical opinion, is that that stuff is uh, to a large extent like caused or promoted by living in a pathological culture where your needs aren't met. It's like, yeah, of course you have anxiety. You're like blasted with anxiety inducing shit. Like, a thousand times a day and no one is telling you how to handle that yeah. no one's telling you how to like get back to yourself and be like no i'm okay i could ignore this and then yeah no one taught you that and then just every day there's more shit that's going to cause you anxiety that's being like thrust upon you it's that way, I think it's kind of amazing that more people don't have like aren't diagnosed with anxiety and aren't and it's already so many but like it's amazing that it's not everyone <laughs> literally what i was about to say yeah yeah, it's incredible that like some of us still function. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you said something that I liked, which was uh, my only warning is that if you think you don't need something that most people need, ask whether your subconscious is blocking this out. If you still don't think you need it, then you're free to ignore that need. But I think one of my things was that, I mean, very similar to you from a pretty young age, I was like, shit's fucked. There's something wrong with this. There's something's not right here. And 
uh, earlier on that expresses like kind of uh, hate and rejection. And I just wanted to like get away from everything. And I convinced myself that I didn't need any other people. And so like I completely suppressed my need for intimate relationships and friendships and community and social needs and things like that. Um, and if I was a little bit more self-aware at that time, it would have helped me out. But I mean, like one of my kind of big picture takeaways from all the stuff that you just wrote about was like this, how critical self-awareness is and how critical it is to have some kind of map of your own needs, whether that's Maslow or anything else, it doesn't matter what it is, as, as long as it's useful. Um, and to like examine those and say like, okay, as you said, there are consequences to having unmet needs. And when you don't understand what those are, they express themselves in weird ways in your life that aren't going to make your life any better. That's for sure. And so like, as you said, organizing, getting your needs met is a great way to organize your freedom too, to move yourself in the direction of real, like authentic self-actualization. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I mean, I think getting your, like looking at the needs, you can get, you can go a really long way just looking at your needs. <laughs> you, you know, I mean, you're going to be just, if you just had that as some like template when you were born, you're not going to, and you have no context. So what does it mean? But I think as a, as a fully formed adult, if you just are like, start concentrating on your needs, it like really gets you really far and looking out for the insecurities because the insecurities are going to block you from knowing your needs. I don't know. My, that is my like insecurity thing that happens is I get blocked from knowing my needs. Maybe that's just me saying what happens to me. But when I see other people have insecurities, I feel like they also are blind to their needs. I don't know. It's not happening in me. So I don't know. Well, that's another important thing actually, is that I don't know if I put it that much. And that's kind of what I meant in that part that you wrote, like your needs come from you. So I can't tell you, you know, I can be like, right this is a human need, but it's not. It's like, yeah. aside from the shit you need, we all need to stay alive. Like your needs are your own. So you get to define them. You don't, you know, don't let anyone else tell you what you need. That if you're letting someone else tell you what you need, that's coming from insecurity almost. Mm. Yeah. No, I think you're totally right about that. And it's, it's worth underlining both quantity of a need and whether a defined, however, someone else defines a need is a real need for you. And it could express in different ways. Like, a, a, a word that occurs to me as a need is for uh, like relatedness. I think most people talk about like relationships and community with other human beings, but some people are capable of having um, a sense of relatedness and connection to things that aren't human beings. And so it's like, you know, one person might need to have close intimate connections with 25 people. I don't know. That seems like a lot to me, <laughs> but another person might be fine with like one close human relationship, a bunch of acquaintances, and then like really deep relatedness with, ideas or projects or books or initiatives or non-human beings or like the ecosphere or whatever else i don't even know right but like that's a different way that that kind of need like manifests in their life and there's nothing wrong with them for only having one intimate relationship in their life i hypothesize i mean obviously we're not experts on this stuff but um there's a broad there's a broad spectrum of human expression and that's part of what's so great about being human and getting to hang out with people is be like, wow, you're different in a really weird way. That's cool. Let's hang out. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that actually is something that's really important to emphasize is that, yeah, no one gets to tell you what your needs are. And uh, aside from the fact that I assume you probably need food, air and water <laughs> and sleep, I don't really know. You know, you get to make up the other shit and you get to figure it out. Yeah. It's both great and terrible. No one can tell you what to do. <laughs> you, you have to figure it out. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, I actually had it. This probably won't make it in the in the recording. But uh, after when I was, you know, writing down my list last night and, and looking at it, I was like, man, you know, I, my 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 sexual need is at a one, meaning like completely unmet right now. And I know that. And I'm just like, that's just because that's how my life works right now. I'm like, eh, I'll deal with that later. But you got me thinking like, well, what is my actual need? Like, do I need to have sex multiple times a day? Like, no, I don't. Like, that's not actually my need. So like, what's my actual need? And I was thinking like, like, if I had to put that slider somewhere, like what's enough? I've also been reading a bunch of voluntary simplicity stuff, which is the whole like, you know, sufficiency, like 
what is enough for you because our society tries to teach us that like you just need more you need all of it and i i had kind of bought into this narrative that like oh well i'm a man therefore i need to have sex at least eight times a week if i don't have sex eight times a week something wrong with me it's like that might not be true for me <laughs> and, and someone who needs sex like a million times a week it is not true for most men which was like <laughs> a shocking realization when i realized it <laughs> in my 30s i was like oh, oh. <laughs> this is actually quite rare quite rare to need that much yeah no most men don't really yeah. even sex that much it's just like something you're told that you want right yeah because our our culture is so hyper sexualized it's like yeah there's something wrong with you well for men you know uh, yeah that's a whole different it's gonna yeah. be a long thing but <laughs> yeah and then but then yeah so thinking about that helped me think like of where i actually wanted that to be and f- particularly because i live out in the middle of nowhere that has implications for how i design my life what i do what processes that i have you know that's no no i sometimes think about coming out there and i'm like there's no women <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so that's 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 uh that's an act well that's that's a soon to be active project <laughs> for me to figure that out for myself but yeah it'll it'll have to be a creative solution because there is nothing out here i also wanted to point out something you pointed out that a lot of people when they look up maslow's hierarchy of needs they see the old traditional one which peaks with self-actualization but his last like book even i think was he was talking about how actually the, the pinnacle or the top of his pyramid or whatever is self-transcendence not self-actualization well i didn't actually ignore the top two levels because they were too i couldn't think about what to say about them like i feel like that's just kind of a journey you're on your entire life and i I kind of also like do i think it's a hierarchy i don't know i kind of see why it's a hierarchy i could kind of see why it's not a hierarchy i definitely think the like actualization and transcendence things at the top obviously makes sense like you have to do kind of have to do the other stuff first yeah that's like that's a journey you're just going to be on your entire life and whether you get there or not is like totally up to you. So I do think doing these things, if that is a goal or just even something you want to be as a byproduct, like focusing on, to me, the question isn't like which of Maslow's needs. It's just like, what do you need? Mm, yeah. Very therapy way of doing That's like what the therapist says when you walk in. What do you need? Fuck you. <laughs> at least that's what i'd say if you're me <laughs> how, how dare you <laughs> yeah i mean so i mean you kind of already answered the question but so if, if one were to use maslow's hierarchy as a as a framework to start thinking about this do you think that they they have to like absolutely fulfill each layer before they can start working on the next one no maslow does not Maslow is like very clear that he does not think that. I, 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 so, it somewhat comes apart if you really try to think of the hierarchy. I don't know. Like it sort of makes sense. It makes sense. The more towards the bottom you go, I think it makes sense. Like you're if you don't if you don't have those baseline physiological needs met, like if you're not getting those baseline physiological needs met, then I think it's very hard to move up to the other ones. And all, safety also makes sense. Like if you're not really safe. And again, this is like, you're going to trigger your like insecurity things. But when, if you're not safe, you're like, that's your insecurities are working. That's like, it's supposed to get triggered. It's like fighter. You're going to fight or flight right. when you're not supposed to. But if you're not safe, you want to go into fight or flight <laughs> mode. So yeah, like the bottom ones I think are more accurate. I even, I reversed his, I put like, I forget what I did. I think I put emotional below social because to me that makes more sense. But I think he is social before emotional. I don't know. I don't really think the the hierarchy is that important. I mean, you should make your own hierarchy, really. Right. From from my perspective, it's again, it's not like I really I did the Maslow's thing just because it's such so comprehensive. But yeah, well, you can, you can make your own needs up. Like they don't have to follow his. I also I actually used a different one that I kind of use more in real life, which is using a permaculture, which I've almost no understanding of. But it's like it's the zones as they move away from you. Yeah. Yeah. So like zone zero is just like your body. So it's like, if you're not healthy, then you want to start with that, but, and move away. I don't think that one's either. Like you're going to want some shit outside your body before you're like totally healthy again. But in some mm-hmm. ways, I think that's actually a better approach if you're like attempting a hierarchy. Yeah. Well, like if you're not getting your food well, then like, don't, you don't need to like learn how to build a building yet or something. <laughs> 
<laughs> something that i read in i think the mollison permaculture which i'm studying at the moment is i was reading about the process for doing a permaculture design for a site right because i'm trying to figure out like what do i do first what do i now as i analyze first like how do i even approach this and the idea was you do all this observation and you know try to understand the site uh and everything before you do anything for sure but then the idea is you create a master plan of the whole site with rough patterns not the details you start with pattern working from patterns to details is a big permaculture principle um but so you, you create this master plan that lets you kind of know where to start like where's a good place to start and then you can iterate the plan and the design from there um but what stuck out to me was the point that where you want to start is you want to start as close to zone zero as possible zone one zone zero whatever and you want to create a nucleus of implementation of something that you've built that serves your needs in some way and you get that set and you get it as close to you as possible so that it's right there every time you wake up you're looking at it you're seeing it and then once you get that nucleus sort of mature and it's and it's working well then you can kind of go out in the zones from there and and build up and the zones are they're not supposed to be like circles necessarily they like you can have zone five come all the way close to your house and, and all these other things so um i mean permaculture is just systems thinking and eerie is systems thinking so the yeah i would actually I, I like that better than the maslow hierarchy like what you just said and the, and also that the zones can you know what you might think of as far away from you in a far out zone might actually be not that far away from you yeah but, because because but in permaculture that... the zones are the zone the zones have to do with frequency frequency of use like how often do you have like how often do you have to go to this thing? How often do you have to either care for it or how often do you have to harvest it, right? So chickens, they got to be pretty close because you got to feed them every day and make sure that foxes don't kill them and whatever. But your orchard, it can be kind of farther out there. You don't have to go there like 20 times a year or whatever, something like that. So I yeah, I would say that's, that's actually like, I don't think that's 100% overlap, but maybe it's like 80% because there's some that you're just not going to do that often that you really need, but it's not, there's not that many of those things. Right. And other than that, I'd say frequency of use is probably a better way to think of needs than a hierarchy, some dude who's already dead made up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and, 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 you know, also from permaculture, there's the whole, um, the relationship between the components is a big part of the design because you want to set things up. So that, like the outputs from one become the inputs from the other. And we can kind of think about that in terms of needs as well. Yeah, and if I knew more about permaculture from what you're saying, I probably would have used that as my. Well, hey, because I, I need a big. I wanted a big framework to show how you could go about thinking about this, and that can be like a really big yeah. thought process. So I just picked one, but totally, I'd probably have gone with permaculture if I understood permaculture more than just knowing that there are zones that go outward from you. That's <laughs> just the only thing I do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah. So, all right. So the next 20,000 words are going to be adapting the framework to permaculture. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, I think it's, I mean, I think, I think what's nice about using the Maslow's hierarchy is just that like so many people are familiar with it. It's really simple. You don't have to necessarily wrap around your head around systems thinking and like, you know, zones of permanence and stuff like that to be able to even just start thinking about it with, with your post. And I was able to just quickly like start thinking about my needs in a way that I hadn't been doing before. Um, and that was already really valuable. So I think that's great. Yeah, well, you're not really taught to think about what you need. It's almost considered, that's considered to be selfish. Yeah. But in my opinion, you can't think about what anyone else needs until your need. If your needs are not covered in an area, you're not going to think about what someone else needs. It's just not going to happen. It's like impossible Yeah. for people. You're not really, if you say you're doing it, you're lying. <laughs> to, <laughs> you yourself. Yeah. to yourself. Yeah. yourself. <laughs> and most everyone else. Yeah. Yeah. No, I totally agree with that. And I mean, yeah, I think I've said this before. That was my story. I was trying to like save the world before I had my own head screwed on straight and it did not work. <laughs> no, it's, so, yeah, it would never work. Yeah. I think where we just left off is also that like you, you should, your needs can only be things that you control. Hmm. Yeah, that's a big one for anxiety. You know, people get people get anxious about stuff they don't control all the time. And like if you can't control it, it's not like don't put it in your needs. Like you don't need world peace, you know. It would be nice, but <laughs> you don't have control over that. You have to phrase it in a way that makes it something that you can actually control. That's a really good way to put it. Like I could put on my 
on my needs graph a stable climate or CO2 PPM below 400, but I don't really control that. <laughs> Can't really yeah, no, that's maybe that. even all the rules that you can only put stuff that you control. Yeah, that's a really good point. It's a really good point. Like there's, and there's way, if you don't control something that you care about, you, that, that's sort of the point. If you don't control something that you care about, there's a way you can figure out how to like pair that into something that you do control. Like maybe that means that CO2 activism mm. is really important to you. Or maybe, you know, I mean, you could say you need the earth to be a certain temperature. You will die. That's true. But again, you don't, I, mean, I guess if you, it, you could have a need you don't control, but if you don't control it, <laughs> you can't do anything. So. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah, like, it's not really true. I mean, you know, if someone's cutting off your water, like you do technically need that, so you'll die. But if you don't have no control over it, then yeah, it's good. It's 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 really important to think about what you control. At least maybe maybe you can have needs you don't control, but they're just kind of going to go go unmet if you don't actually control the control them. It's control is very important. Yeah, it's and really, a lot of people because people will try. This is where the insecurities sneak up on you. You'll try to put the needs that you need that you do control into something you don't control or something someone uh, else. Needs. And that will fuck you every time. Can you give an and example? Like sneaking way around it is like, oh, if only. How many times in your life do you think like, if only this thing I have no fucking control over would go <laughs> the way that I wanted to, my life would be perfect. Like, yeah, it's not how you want to be thinking about it. It's really hard to not think about that, but you want to get away from that. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing that came up is like one of the you asked me this question like almost at the start but one of the reasons i also came up with this is because i don't like focusing on purely practical things so when i'm like learning skills i usually get distracted by something that's fun and i was just trying to think about how that fit into what i'm doing because like jacob is so practical and every, you know he's he and i i think that the, the practical stuff is fun to him i don't think he's ignoring what's fun to him and he will get, you'll see him get caught up in some shit where you're like, you don't really like it. <laughs> <laughs> you need to be building like a flight simulator, you know? <laughs> like, oh, I think that's totally fun think, for him. Yeah. No, I don't think he harps on the, I don't think he intentionally harps on like the practicality of it. I think he like really actually secretly focuses on fun. But the message I got out of it was that you should be focusing on practicality. And I just uh -huh. don't do that. It's like a lot of the shit I do is shit that I do not need to do. Mm. You know, well, I'm using need in two different ways here. It's you know, it's not a survival thing. It's not like oh, this or like it won't reduce my money the most. Sometimes it makes me spend more money. Right. So it was just like, why am I doing this? Like, and how, why am I doing anything? And this is kind of my answer to that. <laughs> so when I get like when I'm like painting a suit polka dots for like four months instead of learning how to garden, I'm like, uh, this feels right, but what is happening? <laughs> it's like that's why because i need the like artistic expression more than i need mm. to garden a for food which i actually have of five different ways of you know or mm. at least solid ways of meeting that need mm. you've got you've got uh resilience and abundance for food but you don't have that many ways you're meeting your need for uh your aesthetic needs perhaps you 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 would call it um yeah yeah so yeah that so that's why Perhaps your unconscious even is being like, nope, we're making a polka dot suit. Yeah. I usually, I try to really do what I feel like most of the time with some structure. I think if I really, I don't know, I feel like there's probably like some psychological terms for all these different like things that happen in your head. But if I really just let the like whims go, I would never accomplish anything because I would just be like constantly distracted. So <laughs> with some, with some structure that I actually do want to get finished products occasionally but yeah usually when i wake up if i don't have to go to work or don't have an obligation which is most days uh i just do i try and kind of do whatever i want but it was, i get and this is like my answer to why do i want these things especially when they're not an obvious practicality towards mm. my like master ere pun also they all cascade into each other like do i like painting my suits because they're like fun or like writing music because it's fun purely on its own and like when I hear it and I make something I'm proud of, I feel really happy to show it to myself. Yeah, but like, do I want to show it to other people and have them be like, holy shit, this is awesome. Like, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing it for the approval of other people. <laughs> I'm doing it for myself, for the expression, and I'm doing it for the social need, like the emotional expression, the emotional satisfaction. 
the possible like getting something from someone else of it to meet like a physiological need, you know, I'm doing it doing it for like every need really. Yeah. Thinking about how I'm gonna do it for the intellectual need. Mm -hmm. You really start to see how like even though it's like one is the primary expression, it's like a lot of them hit everything. A web of needs. Web of needs. That's what I called my chart that I made. It's called web of needs. Oh nice. <laughs> <laughs> Because that's, yeah, and if you pick the, it's kind of like level of goals. Like if you pick the thing that you're doing and you tie all your needs into it, you'll see that mm. it usually will hit a lot of them. But you might think it's hitting this one, but it'll actually hit a ton of them. Mm, yeah, sure. No, that makes a ton of sense. Well, and like a web of goals, that was the chart I tried to make and it quickly got too complicated. Yes. Yeah. Well, <laughs> maybe better as a thought experiment. Well, I was going to say, <laughs> I believe that to be true, but there is what I'm spending my afternoon on making a web of needs. <laughs> um, Sweet. Well, good luck editing this into a podcast. <laughs> I no, I think this is going to be great. Um, yeah, I think it's going to be awesome. And I, yeah, like I said, I'm planning on doing some like readings of some excerpts from your stuff. Um, Man, Jesus. I don't know if you could flatter me more than that. Please. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm gonna like edit the audio. I'm gonna I'm gonna like make myself sound like Morgan Freeman. It's gonna be amazing. Yes. Oh my god. Amazing. <laughs> a belief that I strongly hold that I want to re-emphasize is the pathological nature of our culture. I would like the opportunity to leave the consumer treadmill. I would like the environment not to be massively abused with ecosystems daily destroyed and carbon emissions out of control. But these are symptoms of a pathological culture which does not serve its people. I believe leaving the cave is about so much more than exiting the consumer treadmill or making what small impact we can in the continued ecological destruction. It's about reconstructing a personal, and hopefully someday larger than personal, way of living that is in alignment with our actual beliefs, the people we share our life with, and the environment around us. It provides a new myth to replace the myth of consumption and technological progress. Subversively using the tools of the old myth against itself, it seeks to define a new way to live in preparation for the old ways to hit their ecological limits.